Well, we've been blessed all week, all week with uh, music and uh, yeah, people just praising the Lord in song. And we know it's not going to be any different tonight. Uh, just We're just going to be blessed this evening. Nikki Skidmore is here, and we're thankful that she's here this evening, uh, even in the midst of what's going on right now. Uh, she still came to praise God, Amen. and we're so thankful for that. God has given her a talent, and uh, she's just going to use those talents for His glory tonight. So, Nikki, would you come forward and and uh, praise the Lord for us? Okay, so we are in strange, chaotic times, as everybody is well aware of. It's all around us nationally, regionally, locally, and even in some of our homes. Anxiety, worry, fear, confusion. Lack of trust and on and on have all been invading my life here and there, and maybe yours as well. There are so many great new and old songs to choose from when I'm asked to share in a song during an event. So I went through many different songs lost in confusion and choices for this. Two songs stuck in my head and kind of called out to me, and I believe that was on purpose to align with the confusion that I'm experiencing in this seemingly simple task of selecting a couple songs as well as in life and in the world around us. So the two songs that I've chosen are kind of relaxed and give this message of peaceful renewal or maybe the sense of a peaceful revival. I hope these songs ease you and bring you back to a place of comfort and peace. And the first one is called Symphony.
these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but also take heart, I have overcome the world. That's from John 16, 33. It's another verse that kind of called out to me when I was trying to pick and prepare songs for tonight. And this is a new song that has been kind of beating my eardrums on K-Love, if anybody listens to K-Love. I don't know how well I'm going to do in, in this one. It's called Be Alright. And if you know it, please sing it. As always, I love when you can sing along. <clears throat> Thank you. 
situation by prayer and petition present your requests to God Philippians 4 6 my last message for you comes from John 14 27 peace I leave with you my peace I give you I do not give to you as the world gives do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid go in peace live in the moment in front of you tomorrow is never promised Yes. Half that song is done in Spanish, and I was ready. She didn't cue me, see? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to pass that opportunity up. But thank you, Nikki. We were blessed. I was blessed. I was blessed. I, and I, I believe everyone here was, too. So thank you very much. Blessings to you. So we've had a great week of revival, and it's not over with yet. This is only Wednesday, right? This, we're only halfway through. Yeah, this is only halfway through, so it's exciting. Again, glad you're here. Uh, I hope you have pen in hand, ready to take notes, and uh, to be uh, blessed, to be filled. I hope your hearts are ready. I believe, uh, Brother Craig, I believe he's ready. I believe he's been waiting for this moment since last night at uh, 9 o'clock or 9.30 or whatever time we dismissed. So at this time, brother, come forward and uh, share with us what God has laid on your heart tonight. Well, here we are once again. Some of you have moved up and filled in the middle benches, but I don't see too many new faces. Good grief. You know... Uh, That's what C.S. Lewis said. Huh? Yeah. That's what he said. Good grief. We, uh, I'm trying to think what Vance Abner said, uh, I don't know if it was him or someone else said, uh, you know, when you talk about, uh, when you talk about the Lord, you ought to smile, and have your best look. And he said, uh, well, when you talk about other things, well, your normal face will do. <laughs> <laughs> Laura said last night, she said, I don't think the people got that joke. <laughs> when I said Lot's wife turned, looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt, and the Laura turned back one time and she turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Yeah, we got it. Just yeah. wasn't good one. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> oh, brother, work with me, Mike. Work okay. with me, please, please. Well, it's a Wednesday night already. Out at uh, Blue River right now, they I hope they're getting into the Bible study. Sometimes uh, we, we start at seven on Wednesday nights, and uh, uh, sometimes we make it to the prayer to the lesson by 7:30 uh, in our discussion, our prayer, and our laughter. Uh, I serve a church that likes to laugh. Uh, usually they're laughing at me rather than with me, but we try to work at that too. Uh, but uh, no. Uh, it's just uh, amazing what God does, and through the laughter and the smiles of His people. Second Timothy, chapter three. Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter three, verses sixteen and seventeen. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The Word of God says, and I quote, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then Paul goes on to say, I charge you therefore, before God and Lord Jesus Christ, to a judge the living and the dead that is appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own devices or their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up. Mm -hmm for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Years ago, as a boy in this church, we sang a song, usually at Bible school time. The B-I-B-L-E Yes, that's the book for me I stand alone on the Word of God The B-I-B-L-E Wow, you're still pretty good at that. Wow. Yet a lot of churches, a lot of pastors, some whom I know personally, have no interest in that little song we just sang. <laughs> have no interest, no desire to present the Bible as the Word of God. To many people, it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient to their morality, it's inconvenient to their selfishness. I looked, I thought, thought about the site tonight preaching on Simon in the book of Acts, Simon, Acts chapter 8. Simon the magician. Mm. The word of God was inconvenient to him. He wanted to buy the gospel. He wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. But he wanted to bypass actually being born again and bypass the word of God. But the Bible is inconvenient to people's morality these days, to people's selfishness to people's relationships. We have people who say, well, God is still speaking. I will agree that God speaks through His creation and God illuminates His Word, but He's still saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. The message is still the same. Amen. Praise God. Several years ago, I preached a sermon, a series of sermons on the Reformation doctrines. And this is one of those messages. The Reformers believed in sola scriptura. The Bible and only the Bible as the basis for our faith. Today, we want to turn to other things. We want people's experiences. And people will tell their experiences all over the place. I mean, we've seen books. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the book about the little boy who went to heaven, supposedly, and then came back. Very little scriptural in that book. The Bible talks a lot about heaven. Oh, I love to read the Bible about heaven. It's great. It's full of information. If you want a good book about heaven, read Randy Alcorn's book on heaven. It's about yay thick. It's fine print. It's not going to be your talk coffee table type of book, but it's going to tell you about what the Bible says about heaven. Yes. Praise God. So we have information about heaven, but a lot of people say, well, there isn't much in the book in the Bible about heaven. I'm thinking, what Bible are they reading? Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, the Bible is God's word, but and it's and it's without error, but it's not sufficient. We need something more. We need psychology. 
Now, I'm not denying the use of some techniques and things like that. But people say, well, we need something more. We need something more for evangelism, that people will not listen to the preaching of the word anymore. You need to have some kind of pizzazz. You need to have a, a system. Mike, I can't believe that you don't have a fog machine in here. <laughs> And where are the pyrotechnics? I told you, buddy. <laughs> you know, a couple years ago, one of my older daughters and I went to a Trans-Siberian Orchestra concert. Have any of you ever been to a Trans-Siberian Orchestra concert? Now, it's not the typical kind of orchestra. Have you ever heard of them? Mm -hmm. Yes, on TV. Oh, on TV. Well, you know, I went, and, and they're, 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 they're known for their Christmas music. Heavy metal Christmas music. And so I thought, well, I'll go to the concert and find out what this is. I sat about halfway back. I'm still, now this is about, about 10 years ago, I'm still recovering my hearing. <laughs> it, and I, I, I said afterwards, I said, it was an assault on the senses. Because it's loud. I mean, they've got electric violins. Why not just electric guitars, but electric violins. And they're all around you when they're performing in concert. And then, then there's the pyrotechnics and the, the gas jets with the flames. And I'm fit, we're, in the, we're in the Fort Wayne Coliseum. I'm sitting about halfway back on the floor level. I'm a good ways away from these performers and I can feel the heat from these gas flames. I'm thinking, if I'm hot from these <laughs> gas flames, what are those people up there on the stage? They're wearing asbestos underwear. <laughs> Oh my word, that was an assault. And you know, that is what a lot of churches are going to. Mm -hmm. Because they think this is what we need to do to get people coming, especially the young people. We need to get people to come in and we need the fog machine. We need, uh, oh, and then, then there's the other trend. Now, not just, not just the, the pyrotechnics and the, the pizzazz and the light show. It makes you dizzy if you're epileptic, have, heaven help you. But, uh, you know, th then, they, then, they, then they go to this uh, uh, palette art. And I'm, I'm not bad on palette art, but, you know, using palettes. You know what palettes are? The things you use to, with a forklift, right? To carry stuff around on. We, we uh, you know, I, we, we've got a mega church in our community, and their whole front is full of palettes as decoration. I'm thinking, is that what we've come to? But we go to these things and, and people say, this is what we need. Well, the thing is, when you start down that path, you have to keep it up. And you always have to be upping your game little by little. And I've always said, what you win them with is what you win them to. Mm -hmm. Think about it. And by the end of a service, by the end of what they call worship, and I think it was Vance Habner said, you know, he said, you can hardly tell the difference between a church and a nightclub anymore. And he was speaking 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And I've always maintained we need to preach the word. Only one word God has given. He's not given us a new word every year. He's not upping the game except what He's already given us over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different authors, writers, on three continents and three languages. The Bible and only the Bible was the basis for our faith. And it's been given by God. That's what... Paul writes to Timothy here, he says, all scripture is given by inspiration. That the word inspiration isn't the kind of word that just says, well, I felt inspired. No, this is God breathing out the word of God. God breathing out the word of God. In 2 Peter, now I'm going to quote this right, because if I don't, if I don't turn to it, I know I'll mess it up. 2 Peter and chapter 1. And verse 21. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That word moved 
is the same word that Luke uses in the book of Acts when he talks about that hurricane wind that drove Paul and Luke's and, and, and Silas's boat across the Mediterranean over a period of two weeks where they saw neither sun nor moon and were blown all over the Mediterranean. That's the very word being used by Paul here in 2 Timothy. Because God has given him a God. God has given it, and because God has given it, it's useful, Paul says. It's profitable. Something that we need to turn to. Sometimes it's like, you know, we, we turn to the Bible kind of as a last resort. We're kind of like, we, we deal with the Bible kind of like we do with prayer. You know, uh, there was the old lady in, in the hospital room. And they administered to her all kinds of medical treatments and she wasn't improving. And, and they called the family in and they're standing around looking at her there. And, and she opens her eyes and, said, and they say, Grandma, we're going to pray. We, you know, it's, we, all we have left is prayer. And she said, oh my, has it come to that? <laughs> Sometimes that's the way we are with the Word of God. Oh my, has it come to the Word of God? Has it come to the Bible? Theodore Epp had the right words back in the day when he called his radio broadcast back to the Bible. The Church of the Brethren, the Brethren movement was a back to the Bible kind of movement in the 1700s. The Reformation was a back to the Bible reaction to the Middle Ages in the 1500s because people were getting away and they forgot what it said. It's like back in the time of Josiah the king and they're, they're, they're doing some remodeling on the temple in Jerusalem. Think of this. They're doing remodeling on the temple, this temple of God that the Jews had worshipped God with since the time of Solomon. They're doing renovations. They knock out a wall or something and they find... What do they find? They find the scrolls. They find the Word of God. And the workmen open it up and say, hey, this is something we haven't seen in a while. In the temple of God, they had not seen the Word of God. And so they got it out and they blew it off. And they started reading it. And, they say, and Josiah says, hey, we need to be reading this in the temple of God because this is God's very Word. And so often in our churches today, we've gotten to that point where Bibles are relegated to the, the bookshelf or they're relegated to the, the, the pew rack and they're not used and people don't bring their Bibles to church. Wow. And some of that's our fault as preachers because we tell people everything else than the Word of God. We don't explain what the sense of the Word of God is, the, the meaning, the application of the Word of God. Paul says it's useful. It's very useful. It's key to our life as a church. I would, I would say that the church without the Word of God has no, is no longer the people of God. And then they chase after everything. But he says it's useful because God has given it. It's worthwhile. It's useful. It's profitable for doctrine or for teaching. Let me bring that down to a level we can all understand. The Bible tells us what's right. It tells us what's right. Psalm 19 says the law of the Lord is perfect. It doesn't need added to, taken away from, perfected, changed. No, I'm not a King James only guy, okay? Because I believe the Word of God is inerrant in the original manuscripts written by the prophets and the apostles. And what, but what we have here is pretty close. Very close. Even a fellow like Bart Ehrman, who teaches at the University of North Carolina, who doesn't believe the Bible, he says, yes, we have pretty much what was written down by those who originally wrote it. And here and there, there might be a little point where a letter's messed up or something, but we have it. It tells us what is right. People want their answers today, don't they? I love YouTube. And not for all the junk, but the fact that I can go on YouTube when I have a problem and I need to correct something or fix something, 
or I need to know how something operates. This is, you know, when I was growing up, down on the farm down in Kenny Valley, you know, we'd be doing all, and my mind would wander as a boy and as a teenager, and I'd think, I'd have all kinds of questions about things. Now, where do you find that out? Well, the internet is a dream come true, because I can look, I can Google that. But I go on and I find out how to do things in the right manner. The Bible tells us, in terms of our spiritual lives, our faith and practice as Christians, it tells us what is right. This is what you do. Want to know how to live your life? It tells you. Want to know about baptism? It tells you. Want to know about the, the, the three-part love feast? It tells you. Want to know about the anointing and for healing according to the Word of God? It tells you. It tells you all about those things. It says this is what you do. It tells you what the gospel is. The good news is that Jesus Christ died for our sins and He rose again the third day. He ascended to heaven. He's coming again. Amen. That's the gospel message. That's what's right. So it tells us what's right for doctrine, for teaching. It also, because God has given it, it's useful for reproof. Are you taking notes, Mike, on this? I am. Okay, good. Yeah. Buddy, stay with me. Okay. For reproof. Now, that's not a word we use very much. But basically, that tells us what is wrong. The Bible tells us what is right. And it's useful and profitable for reproof or what is wrong. Wow. You know, it's one thing when you know what is going right with something, but then you don't know what, what, what's, what, what, what's going wrong, and it tells you, the Bible tells us. You know, like last night's message about Lot. You know, Abram, he's, he's doing what he's doing, and he's under the blessing of God. Lot turns his eyes and his tent, and he's dwelling in, and he's a ruler in Sodom. <laughs> and the Word of God says, Sodom was a wicked city, evil city. It just tells, that's what I love about the Word of God. It tells us about people. Because people say, well, I don't, I don't know if I can believe the Bible because it's got all these stories about all this nasty stuff. And you know, I, I, a number of years ago, I preached all the way through the book of Genesis. It took me four years. And I preached on Genesis 34 and Genesis 38. And some of the commentators I was reading as I was working through those sermons said, these are things that are good for reading, but you dare not preach them in God's, to God's people. And I said, well, right there, you know, that's a wrong idea. You know, in Genesis 34, you can read about it. It's a pretty rough chapter. Jacob's sons were rascals, the, the older ten. And can you imagine why? Can you imagine why, Louise, why they were rascals? Jacob is an absentee father. These boys have four mothers. Wow. And you wonder why they were dysfunctional, but yet they became the patriarchs of Israel. There's going to be uh, foundation stones in heaven named for these rascals. Okay? It tells us, what, and it tells us what's right and what's wrong. And then Genesis 30, and, and, and those rascals, oh, they were rascals. And then Genesis 38, Judah and the story of Tamar, the story of Judah and Tamar. Wow, what a rough thing that was. But the Bible says, what's wrong? It tells us what's wrong. What not to believe. It tells us what to believe, what not to believe. That's what Paul says, uh, there's sound doctrine. And we are to be convincing and rebuking, exhorting with all long suffering and teaching. Third thing it says, the Bible is useful, profitable, worthwhile, helpful for correction. The Bible tells us what is right, what is wrong. Correction means how to get right. How to straighten things up. You know, I, I, I pulled a I pulled a steel leaf blower out of a dumpster this summer. Okay? I know nothing about small engine, or any engine for that matter. But when I pulled it out of the, I, I, I pulled the trigger and boom, it's really, it, 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 it started up. And I thought, okay. I noticed that the primer bulb was bad. And I asked somebody who thought, I thought might know about this particular leaf blower, and they said, oh, the carburetor, you know, it, it's just shot. 
And I thought, well, this shouldn't be too hard to fix. I can get a carburetor kit. You know, went on Amazon. Two, 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 two days later, had the thing in the mail. Wow, put it on, put it together. And it gave me, and I went on YouTube to find those instructional videos, how to get right, how to put it on right. Got it on there, vroom, adjust a little bit, vroom, runs like a dream. I know nothing about small engines. How to get right, what not to do, what to believe, what not to do, how to change around why my life. That's what the Bible tells us. The Bible doesn't leave us questioning, well, how do I change my life? It says, look unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith in Hebrews. Looking unto Jesus. The Paul saying to the Philippian jailer, Philippian jailer never heard of anything Christian before. Oftentimes, when Paul walked into the city of Philippi, he was the first Christian they had ever seen. And one thing is, when Paul walked into a new city, he looked for one thing to see where his base of operation, he looked for a steeple. Because every Jewish synagogue had a steeple. Paul walked in Philippi. There wasn't any steeple because there wasn't that many Jew, Jews to have a synagogue. But he goes and he tells this Philippian jailer, he's in prison, he's been singing, he and Silas have been singing. Midnight, there was an earthquake. And then finally, the, make the long story short, the Philippian jailer comes to Paul and Silas and says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You and your house will be saved. He told the Philippian jet. And he didn't have to go through a long song and dance about what the gospel was and giving the basis for it and all, all this other kind of thing. He just says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you should be saved. Paul didn't spend too much more time in Philippi. In fact, he was invited to leave the very next morning. And the Philippian church grew from that Philippian jailer and some others. They told him how to get right, and that's to look to Jesus. Word of God is useful for doctrine, what is right, for reproof, what is wrong, for correction, how to get right, for instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. Once you get on the right path, the Bible gives us that guidance as we read it, as we study it, we meditate on it, we take it seriously, we believe it as God's Word to know what we should be doing and how what kind of life we should be leading. How to stay right. So it tells us what is right, what is wrong, how to get right, how to stay right. It is so that, and he says, for this reason, verse 17, the man of God, this is the, and this is being generic, okay, the man of God may be complete, thoroughly kept equipped for every good work. You want to know how to do everything in the church, the word of God gives you what you need. You want to know about the beginning of the world, it gives you what you need. You want to know about the end of the world, it tells you what you need to know. You know, anything between the beginning and the end, it tells you what you need to know. It gives you God's last word on guidance. People say, well, how do I know the will of God for my life? Right here it is. Boom. As my daughter says, boom, shakalaka. Right? It's right there. And then we're trying, we're running around saying, oh, I don't know what God's will. I'm praying for God's will. Look to the Word. And if it's not in the Word, God doesn't care what you're doing with it. Okay? Wow. So we're prepared, equipped, and ready to do God's will. Now here are some implications very quickly. The Bible tells us what is right, what is wrong, how to get right, how to stay right. You got those points down, Mike? Okay. Buddy, you have all along. Okay. He's looking to go back to the, to the video later on. You know. Here's some implications. Implications, applications, whatever you want to do with them. Everything must be through, seen through the lens of Scripture. Because this is the only objective Word of God that we have. Everything else is subjective. Everything else is mediated through somebody's opinions. The Word of God is not. Now people will say, ignorant people will say, 
They'll say, well, you know, what you believe about the Bible is just what you believe, and, and nobody else believes that kind of thing. Everybody has a different opinion. No, if you go back through church history, the last 2,000 years, you will find the remarkable consistency of those who believe the Word of God and what they teach and practice and believe. It's the only objective portion that we have in our faith. Everything else is subject. And everything must be seen through that lens of Scripture, whether it's nature or history or our emotions. Sometimes we start out with our emotions and then go to the Word of God. And then we say these, we, we, I hear these dreaded words, well, I feel... It's, it's interesting if you, if you pay attention to culture. Fifty years ago, when people had an opinion, they said, I think now people say, I feel, well, I just feel that that's not really appropriate for this day and age. What? No, what does the Bible say? We don't really care what, it what or, or we hear people say, Mike, that you hear people say, well, this means to me. No, the Bible has one and only one meaning in every scripture passage. One and only one meaning. Many applications, many applications, but only one meaning. And we need to look at that meaning throughout history. And every other discipline must come under the lens of Scripture. Second implication is this. Tradition and history, things I love dearly, understand me. Tradition and history must, they are helpful Yet Scripture is the final authority. It's the last word on anything related to God. Again, people want to say, well, I feel this way. Or, I have a hard time thinking this. Or, the phrase, well, my God wouldn't do X, Y, or Z. You know what the problem is that? That's a violation of the second commandment right there. Boom. Violation of the second commandment when people start imagining a God after their own devices and they create an image of God that's false and not scriptural. When I say, well, I, I, I like to think of God as being loving and never sending anybody to hell. Okay. You can think that, but you can feel that. But that's not according to the Word of God, is it? That's not according to the Word of God. It's not what God Himself has said. It's the last word. The Bible is the last word. Someone has said that the church is being, has been a long Bible study through the ages. And we need to look to that long Bible study and say we, we appreciate that, but the final authority is going to the Word. What does the Word itself say? The third implication is this. Scripture establishes our faith. Our faith doesn't establish the Word of God. The Word of God establishes our faith. Because it's through the Word of God that the world was created when God said, let there be light. It's through the Word of God that the church was created. The church didn't come up with the Bible. The Bible created the church. All the church did was recognize and say, hey, this is the Word of God, and we know it. There's no question about it. The Word of God saves. It's through His Word through preaching, right, Mike? His Word through preaching. It gives us everything. It's our foundation. It gives us our faith for and our foundation for the church, for our personal relationship with Christ. For the basis of everything, everything necessary for salvation and godliness is there. It says all things, all scriptures given by inspiration is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, that we may be thoroughly complete and equipped. And then we're to preach that. And scripture shows us the way of salvation. 
And tonight I'm here to say that the Bible is sufficient for our teaching. It is sufficient for our evangelism. It's sufficient for our counseling. It's sufficient to understand the future. And that's why Paul says, preach the word. Be already in season and out of season. Now some people say, well, you know, people won't listen to the plain preaching of the word of God anymore. And I say, and your point is, and they said, well, the, the, the preaching of the Bible, that just doesn't work. And we can't just preach the Bible. And no, this is what we have in season, out of season, when it's convenient, when it's inconvenient, when people will listen, when people will not listen. In fact, Paul says there, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will put up with it. They want the light show. They want the fireworks. They want the fog machine. They want the heavy metal music. And Paul's answer is preach the word. You know, if we think all this is new, it's not new. People have always been trying to worship their gods through other means other than the preaching of the Word of God. You know, worship consists of four basic things, and only four basic things. Pray, giving, singing, preaching. Those are the four things that make up worship. We add to that, we come into problems. Okay? And so our answer today is you say, well, young people aren't coming to church. Use the word. People aren't being saved. Use the word. I don't know what my my future should be. Use the word. How do I handle people? dealing with their issues of life. Use the word. What about COVID? Use the word. We act like this is the first plague that's ever hit human society. What if we were alive in 1342? 1342, people in Europe started dying, not by the dozens, not by the score, not by the hundreds, not by the thousands, not by the millions. But one third of the population died as a result of the plague. And they didn't know where it came from, where how it was transmitted. You find people wearing masks back then because they weren't sure. They, they thought it was transmitted because by people breathing on them. Foul odors, foul vapors, Ill, Ill vapors coming from one another. No, it was being transmitted by a little flea that came on the rats. And back then, there weren't too much difference between rats and people for fleas, you know. <laughs> they had, and what did they do? They preached the word. In London in the 1850s, late 1850s, there was a huge cholera outbreak. Cholera is a nasty thing. Oh, man. I think COVID's bad. Cholera would kill you quicker than you, you could even think. And there's a massive outbreak because they were they were taking their water out of water sources that were downstream from where they had eliminated from themselves. And they spread cholera. And there was a massive cholera outbreak in London. Charles Spurgeon said, we're going to preach the word. We're going to, we're going to lift up God. We're going to lift up the word of God in the midst of this cholera outbreak. He said, I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to do what I need to do, but I'm going to preach the word. And so... Everything must be seen through the lens of Scripture. Tradition and history is helpful, yet Scripture is final authority. Scripture establishes our faith. Scripture shows us the way of salvation. And we must use the Word. One of the challenges I find in many of our churches is that Christians, professing Christians, do not know the Bible. And we find Christians coming to church without their Bibles. That's as silly as going to school without your textbook. Okay? We must know the Bible. We must believe the Bible as God's Word. We must 
preach the Bible, whether we're a preacher or a deacon or some other leader in the church or just uh, ordinary Christians, be using the Bible and obey the Bible. Because it's the only word we have. I'm not aware that God's given us a new word. And our friends in the Mormon church always says, oh yes, they he's given us another testament. No, it's not. That Joseph Smith could take a science fiction novel of 1815 and turn it into a religion that he somewhat came up with uh, on golden plates on the side of the Hill of Camorra in New York State a few years later. And yet millions of people, it's America's largest homegrown religion. And it's false. Or Charles Russell. Saying, well, you know, uh, we, we want to get back to what the Bible really said. And the Bible really doesn't talk about hell. Really? Come on. Oh, my. And then there's new religions, and, and they're crazier. You know, people say, oh, I can't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And yet they'll believe everything else, Mike. They'll believe everything else. There's only one word, and this is it. This is the word we must learn. This is the word we must preach. This is the word we must believe. This is the word we must obey. Telling us what is right, what is wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. Only one word. And when we abandon that, we abandon all of our principles as Reformation Christians. And we're repeating some of the mistakes the Middle Ages all over here. God is speaking through His Word. And we must turn to it. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, all patience and teaching. In season, out of season. Because, friends, that's all I have. I'm not smart enough to come up with my own stuff. And Mike's not smart enough. I know Buddy's not smart enough. Huh? And I don't know any preacher that's smart enough. God is. Use your Bibles. Demand the preaching of the Word. Obey it. Know it. Study it. For the glory of God. Amen. Jesus is quoted in this book. It says, where He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. That nobody comes to the Father but by me. Amen. It's written. It's written. But you know, people today, they want that feel-good gospel preached to them. They want a gospel where there could be other ways to get to the Father. There could be other ways to get to heaven. And you would think that in the community that we live in, that is a conservative type of a community, uh, you would think would be a Bible preaching community, so you would think. I was at a church service locally, same church, one wedding, two funerals, the same pastor for all three of those who opened the Bible, read some scripture, closed the Bible, and he says, but I like how the Koran says it better. Oh, no. Filled with 125 people. It wasn't once. I didn't hear it twice. I heard it three times. Wow. Forget that. The same pastor of this large church had a celebration of life. You know, I'm a pet lover. 
Yeah, sure. I like uh, yeah. dogs, cats, yeah. ferrets, yeah. goldfish. Yeah. goldfish. I'm a pet lover. He had a celebration of life for someone's dog. Okay. The, the dog would go to doggy heaven. <laughs> but he, people were there because they want that feel good gospel preached to them, the itchy ears gospel. Forget the truth, you know. They they just want to feel good about themselves when they leave church. And you don't always feel good when you leave church. Maybe uplifted, but convicted a lot of times. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by Him. That's right. It's my hope that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If coming into this service tonight you did not know Him, but you've been coming and shadowing the doors in the pew for years, <laughs> if you've been coming, but tonight the Holy Spirit convicted your heart to give your heart to Jesus tonight, to repent of your sins, to turn away from your sins, and just as the jailer in Philippians, yes. believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, That's you and your household. Because what a witness he did. And all filled me, you know. So if you, if you know now Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and you want to come forth, because you've already accepted him in your heart, you just don't know that you can come forward and publicly acknowledge before God and before the people here that Jesus just saved my soul. I'm born again. This altar's open. For you to do that. Can we play I Surrender All, maybe the first and the last last verse of that? And, and if you if you feel the Holy Spirit urging you, got it? The touching band, yeah. at you. 486. Six? Three, six. Come out. Come out. We'll pray with you. That you can pour out your heart to God. Today's the day of salvation. I'll tell you this, if, if the Holy Spirit is nudging you to come out and you don't come out, I hope, and I've told you this before, I hope you cannot sleep tonight as if though you drank five cups of coffee <laughs> and you're wrestling all night and you can't Amen. sleep. Let the Holy Spirit move you and you'll sleep like a baby tonight. So let's, let's sing this to you. Praise the Lord. Two things. Two things. Number one, we need to fill up the pews tomorrow night. Okay, we have two nights left of revival, and that's it. That's it. But the revival will go on in your heart, even after this. But our brother's only going to be here two more nights. So please come. Invite someone. Because they need to hear God's word. Second, again, as a reminder, we're having just a brief meeting, however long that brief may be, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, doesn't matter. But you're welcome to stay and learn more about Covenant Brethren Church. Okay? Blessings to each and every one of you tonight.